Well, yet another misspent evening on eBay has uh, turned up this uh, example of a uh, radio set from the 1970s. Um, it's an RGD Rover. It's not a brand or model that I had ever heard of, actually. I was a bit surprised to see it. Um, and um, I did a bit of research, and RGD were a British company used to make radios back in, valve radios back in the 1960s. And like a lot of other companies, they got swallowed up by, in this case, ITT, which is a big American electronics company. ITT had also bought out another company which operated in Britain, although I think it, started, it had a very interesting history called Colster Brandes. And um, they started making radios under the ITT KB brand, but they also made a few radios using the RGD brand, which they also owned. And these are basically identical to the equivalent ITT KB sets of the time. Um, so um, it's quite a small one um, compared to some of the other radios that we looked at. Um, it's got a ne neat little thing, really. Um, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, there's a bit of, you know, discoloration, the sort of fake wood has rubbed off in places. Um, could do with a bit of cleanup, like all things of that age. Um, pretty simple controls. It's got a on and off tone control, so it's not really much variation available there. I think it's just like a top cut to get rid of interference. It's uh, got a usual telescopic aerial um, for the um, VHF FM band. Um, I think it's got very clear markings, actually. I I'm quite impressed by that. A lot of radios of this age are too crowded. They've got too many things on them. Whereas this has really got just what you need. Of course, a lot of the markings are a bit out of date in that you no longer have Radio 1 there on medium wave. Uh, radio 2 isn't there on long wave anymore. Um, that's where Radio 4 now is. Um, the FM markings are probably largely correct for the stations that were on VHF at the time. Um, the, you'll see all this North, Midland, East, West stuff. Um, well, there isn't an East, actually. Um, the reason for that is that Radio 4 in those days um, wasn't really a national service before the big wave band switchover, which I think was about 75, 76, and that um, switched Radio 1 onto 275, and um, moved Radio 4 into the long wave and things like that. But before that, it wasn't really a national service. So on medium wave, um, you got different regional services for Radio 4. Um, anyway, as I said, I think it's, it's pretty clearly laid out. I, I like the little bit here where it warns you that it's been made by foreigners. That's obviously a very important thing that people needed to know in those days. I was trying to work out where ITT did make their stuff. Um, it looks to me like they made a lot of their stuff in Hong Kong. That would have seemed likely that that would have been um, where this would have been made. Where it was designed, I'm not sure whether it was designed. Um, I, I suspect it was a British design that was made in Hong Kong. Anyway, um, there's no batteries in it at the moment and there's no mains option on this. It hasn't got a, a mains power supply, which makes it quite light, but it means we've got to find some batteries to put into it. Um, so that's the next step, I think, and then see how it works. Well, the good news is that I uh, do have some uh, C cells in my battery box. Um, the less good news is they're um, sort of a little bit out of date, really. Um, March 2011, so yeah, maybe not the newest, but um, they check out they've got one and a half volts on them, I and mean, that's all you can ask for, I suppose. Um, so let's put those in. A bit of a, a bit of a tight fit, to be honest. Mm. Oh, look, that was from twenty ten. That's even older. Um, still, like I say, all the same electricity, and the electricity hasn't changed since twenty ten. So let's do the screws up. go it's um i'll put it on bhf i think and uh we can give it to what mm. that is mm, not ideal so there's a dodgy contact there
if you get it in exactly the right position I can hear something so that sounds good um, should probably put the aerial up Yes. Well, once you get it tuned in, um, sound it makes is quite good actually. I'm not going to that. Oh, wow, quality of the music, but the <laughs> but the sound is quite good um, for a little thing like this. Uh, obviously, we need to look at that. That I, it's obviously got some sort of either bad contact or the pot's fallen apart or something. Um, so hopefully that should be a pretty easy fix and then with a bit of clean up it, it can make quite good reggae. Right, so the next challenge is to get the thing apart which probably involves removing the batteries again. Um, having carefully jammed them into place. That is really annoying when that happens. Um, anyway, we'll sort that out in a moment. Um, there's a rather rusty screw here which holds the aerial in by the looks of things. I don't know if I have to take that out. It looks to me like these two screws here will be the, the ones that hold the thing together. Hmm. Quite long ones. That is promising. I can't see any other screws anywhere on it. Um, do I need to take the area out? It's hmm, not obviously coming apart. Ah, hold on. Ah, oh, no, that looks better. So that is pulling apart. Something's holding it. Probably those things. And there isn't much leverage here to get. Hmm. Ah, ah. Right. Done. This is very tight wiring here that aerial very tight um, no leeway on that at all wires there from the battery compartment um, yeah that that they should have put a longer wire on that really I think the part we're looking at with the problem is here so you can see that there's a variable resistor here with a switch on it and I have to say that it looks um, disappointingly proprietary to me um, there seems to be a sort of fixing here with a couple of bolts um, it looks doesn't look like something that you could just drop one in which is a bit a bit annoying if um, if we do have to replace it because we won't be able to find one like it so we might have to do a bit of a modification there are a couple of posts to hold it on so there's possibly something we could do there I think we're going to have to do a bit more dismantling of this um, and I think also I'm going to take the circuit board out for a start um, this is the next step so the annoying thing here is <clears throat> first of all it looks to me like this is a single part which was specially made for this set which means that it's, it's pretty much unobtainable. Um, so we're going to have to find a way of either fixing it or sort of uh, getting something else in instead. And the other way, is, the other thing is, how do I get at the other these tiny screws to get that thing out? Um, I was wondering if this whole assembly here should lift off because there was a screw on it which I've taken out. But you know what I think is that. These two things here are like little, this is like a couple of little twisted things. They're just like lugs. So I think if I untwist those lugs, then actually that assembly might just pull out and I can get screws at the back of the uh, pot. 
Right, so after a bit of an epic struggle, which I didn't bore you with, I eventually got those two lugs out there, which enabled me to pull this off, which enabled me to take out these tiny screws which are holding the pot in place, and I thought I'd have a look at it. So the usual thing for these old radios, you got um, a... Um, let's get this into shot. You've got a pot, and you've also got this little switchy thing at the end of it. It's very fragile, and uh, don't really want to break it, because there's no chance of getting another one that matches it, I reckon. Um, however, having had a bit of a clean-up, I'll put the batteries back in, clean it up a bit. It's not making all that crackling sound now. There's a little bit of a pop when you switch it on and off. I wonder if it's worth changing the capacitor across the power supply. Um, let me have a look at the old circuit diagram here. There's the switch there, and it's got the usual big capacitor. Actually, not that huge. It's only 100 microfarads, but it's going down to ground. I mean, I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that. I might just take it off and um, have a look at it. It's a bit um, difficult to get at, though, because on the other side of where it's soldered in, so this is the cap here, and if I turn it off the other side of where it's soldered in, um, there's a load of wires can't really see it there's a load of wires glued in place over the top of it which is where I'd want to get at the solder so I'd have to melt all that wax and glue and everything and as I don't think it's particularly bad I'm inclined to leave it as it is and not change that cap um, some people would just routinely change all the electrolytic capacitors here because they'd assume they'd dried out over the years but I'm not hearing any bad performance from it so I think um, what I'll do is stick it all back together I think that's actually, um, apart from the cosmetic stuff that we might want to do to it, and that would be pretty much job done. Well, my elation at getting the audio working reliably was short-lived because um, in putting it back together, I've uh, done the thing that you should absolutely never do when working on old radios, and that is to break this tuning cord. So this is the thing that makes the... Um, it, when you turn the tuning knob, makes this needle move and it is an absolute pain to re-thread these but that's something i've got to do as a result of my own incompetence so um, that will be the subject of another video which is likely to contain strong language